We are into session uh, Biblical Theology, the blossoming of God's revelation from Adam to Christ. Welcome to class. And for those of you who are just coming in, you missed a, a good challenge, a good encouragement. And so I just want to encourage everyone to uh, try to be on time. I actually didn't record that portion, so I won't be able to upload it. But in the future, I'm going to encourage people to go back and watch that come in late because that will be our, our, our spiritual formation part for right now, just because we don't have time for, uh, for, for chapel, for, for uh, spiritual encouragement. And so the, um, just want to encourage you there. And so these are just a, a reminder of our partners, uh, EVST, Converge, and Baptist Theological College and Cebu Graduate School of Theology. So um, we thank them for making this happen. And uh, we are on to TH615. Biblical Theology, Session 4, The Mode and Content of Pre-Redemptive, The Mode and Content of Pre-Redemptive Special Revelation, okay? And so there were some comments about Voss being very difficult, and I, 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 I really admit that he is very difficult, especially in one, one or two places here. And so um, we'll talk about how to handle if something is really not making sense um, in Voss's Sometimes it really is like he's a, it's a home run. And then other times you're like, what is he saying? It's a very, it's very difficult to understand. You have to read between the lines. And that's because he is, a, his English is his second language. So that's, that's somewhat of the difficulty here. Okay. So overview of session, overview of session. Uh, if you notice, it's coming in at the angle because it's coming down. It's the type. It's coming down from, from the reality here. Okay. And so I had to say that it was a joke, joke line. Um, so what we'll be doing first is we're going to have a short breakout room discussion. And so I want you to discuss the reading and also the scripture reading. I want you to get into groups and to discuss. So we will have a short break, breakout room uh, discussion. And so I'll split everyone up for that. Uh, and then we will discuss the mode and content of pre-redemptive special revelation. So we will discuss the mode and content of, of special revelation and uh, originally, I was going to just have the notes and then go to the text, but I think, I think we might we might jump back. Uh, we'll go back and forth with the notes because because the passage of scripture they really connect. And if we get behind and it we have to go slow, that's fine. It's really important here um, that we really understand what's going on here. So, at this point now, I'm going to now that everyone's here, I'm going to uh, we're going to have breakout rooms to discuss the reading amongst yourselves. Uh, we'll do. 10 minutes of just discussion. So let me just create the breakout rooms. All right, so I think, I hope everyone can see the screen there. So let me go, just go ahead and, um, all right, so let's, let's discuss, let's discuss the reading. So let's have two columns here. We'll have observations. And then also maybe there's there's questions. I will seek to answer your questions tonight as as we go through either just now or during the the lecture. But at least if we can write these things down so everyone can be thinking about them. So group number one, I, I don't remember who group number one is, but but you do group number one. Um, what were your observations and or questions? <laughs> I thought ang leader, Pastor Henry. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Pastor Henry. Uh, observations is really, uh, for me personally, uh, just like what I've shared to the group, uh, the biblical, I, I'm still really an elementary, the subject biblical uh, theology is so uh, new to me. Uh, I quite see it uh fascinating but very complicated but i'm i'm really uh, interested in the subject i have so many questions but uh just like what i've, I've discussed to i i've answered to uh the second question because uh there's the one number one is one you you like second is the dislike uh what you don't yeah. like on yeah on the yeah go ahead i'm somehow just I, I feel I, I'm apologetic about it that I don't have anything to disagree for now on, on the on the topic okay. because for me I'm still absor uh, ab absorbing the subject. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still, yeah. uh, maybe later on and my uh, as I gain knowledge I will have a comparison and contrast on on, on everything. Uh, but I'm happy about it and 
for the the chapter 3 on the reading one i really uh, uh see uh, so it as an o inspiring uh uh statement was when uh was mentioned about the garden yeah. uh, page 37 he said that uh, the garden is uh wait that for away the garden is uh not in the first instance an abode for man as such but is specifically a place of reception of man into fellowship with god and that for me is an all inspiring uh scene because when i keep re uh, reading the revelation uh, i mean genesis uh, we'll just keep pass on on this topic uh, on this subject that uh in creation it's really a creation by grace that a holy god an awesome god would create would would uh really meet man and would would have a place to really reveal himself would give an opportunity for man to reveal him uh, to a place to for him to reveal himself to him to, to make himself known to that man and i'm just so amazed with with that with that uh learning uh, uh with that statement of boss so i think that for me <laughs> No, that's really good. That, that was so fundamental for me as well, Chalmer. So, yeah, excellent observation, group number one. Group number two, what is your question or observation? Do not, okay, do not be afraid to disagree with something, okay? Maybe you don't, that's fine. Um, but if you do, don't be afraid. Don't be, don't be shy. Or, or, don't, or don't be shy to maybe want to tweak or to, it's fine. Go ahead, group number two. Hello, team. Anything? <laughs> we, we were not able to really, to really discuss. The, the, the time was so short I'm sorry. Uh, for us. Uh, so we were just jumping from principle one to principle three. Okay. okay. Um, I'm sorry. Next time will uh, be longer. No, <laughs> no worries. <laughs> so what, what happened is just we just, we just tried to understand this, this two principles that, yeah that Voss gave, but, but definitely uh, the, these four principles we, we find uh, at, the, at the first, it's, it's hard to wrap your mind around um, as, as these are symbolisms, but we all agree that as we look at this more closely, we realize that it's there. It's not something forced into the text. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is really there. It is yeah. really there. It's it's an eye opener that we miss this a lot, and yet once you see it, you cannot unsee it anymore. Um, it's 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 there. So one is the principle of the tree of life as a symbol of of uh, the life, the eternal life that that god uh planned from the very beginning yeah no that's good that's good that, that this concept it's it, it's there yeah it's really good and it, did, did you have the second one yeah go ahead yeah it's it is that the, this is not plan b for god this has been yeah the 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 presence of the tree of life uh tells us that the plan of god for man is to have eternal perfection with him. Thus, it is safe to say that at the very start, God gave probation. Yeah. Um, so that eventually, supposedly, man will, will gain that eternal perfection. No, that, that's great. And the probation is really there. And we'll, hopefully we'll see tonight all the covenants through revelation, the probation period is for each one who will secure it and it climaxes in Christ. So it's really this concept that is not forced, it's there. And yeah, wow, excellent, excellent. Okay, group number three, uh, what is your observation or question? No, no pressure, you can say whatever you want in reaction to the text, okay? So go ahead, group number three. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, once again, good, uh, good evening to all. So, uh, I we have a very one observation here about the snake. 
but uh, I, I think it's good if uh, the one share this one in our group will the one to discuss. But before I will proceed to him, uh, I will I will just uh, point out some uh, things that I don't like um, yeah. in Voss. Uh, somehow Voss is sometimes using is is sir is uh, some, Voss is using about somehow a kind of a lot I know. Uh, uh, allegorical interpretation in okay. interpreting the symbolism of uh, the tree of life. So, yes, allegorical interpretation. And uh, for uh, for my colleague, uh, Pastor Dani, he mentioned about that God, uh, this is like the good thing about, according to Pastor Dani, about, uh, no, he mentioned that, Voss mentioned about that God uh, initiated the relationship to 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 man. So that's the thing, but I don't able to get the disagreement of Pastor Danny because um, somehow he, he cut in off uh, during a, uh, a while ago. Then I will proceed to uh, to the concept of snake, and I want to yeah. Pastor Sunny to explain it further for us about the idea of uh, this snake. Uh, he has a lot to he to discuss about the, on this matter. Pastor Sunny, I could have discuss anyway. Um, yes. With regards to uh, allegorical interpretations, I am very careful in you know in thinking of Voss writing because uh, as as we have agreed that Voss is really difficult books, and I've just recently you know uh, based on my reading from from other who are really expounding Voss ideas about these symbolisms that he uses. Uh, here, like you know, the garden, uh, the the tree symbols. Uh, I, I really agree with all those things, but here's my solutions to that. Um, my solution is that uh, the the Pentateuch or the Bible is actually a theological history. Uh, that that it's not historic historical theory, but theological history. What what I mean by that is that the narrative itself, or the narrative, or the biblical narrative itself, is historically accurate i mean it's a historically reliable it's 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 a work of history but there is a sense of a theological uh, i would say slant within the plot of each you know stories or narrative so uh, i would i would agree with you know temper longmans and and the others uh, who who did who did extensive studies on this uh, that that you know the snakes that symbolize death. You know uh, there is, a, you know, uh, boss is using many kinds of, of symbolism like the tree of life as a probation, uh, the serpent as the temptation, and also the, uh, you know, these illusions of of the body as yeah. death. Yeah, th so, that's that's really correct. Um, yeah. So you. I believe those. Go, no, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. There. Yeah. So. Um, so that's actually my solution. So uh, I'm not really sure if if boss is is really the same thought that I have in mind, or he just using the uh, allegor allegorical interpretations. But uh, I, 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 am, I am not, I'm not sure if he's really doing that. So yeah, I, I like that. Uh, I, I really agree with that uh, with Boss. But uh, you know, my, my, my question is if he's using of symbolism as, you know, kind of allegorical, but I'm not really sure so, if he's doing that. So. No, so that's so so there so and I and I think this is very good, great. Um, I, I do like what you're saying as far as because Voss points out they're historical, so he is different than Tremper Longman and others because Tremper Longman will say it doesn't matter whether it's historical or not; it's the theological significance. And so with Voss, I'm pretty sure we can discuss this later, but Voss emphasizes the historical nature of the events. But they're um, in those events. They're symbolizing. They're picturing something greater. Okay, and so we we do that leads us to the question of an allegorical interpretation, and so just to also to think about this um, to kind of wet your whistle. Last week, so um, I'm sorry. Is that is there another group that hasn't gone yet? I'm sorry. Is it Kaya's group too? I'm sorry. Kaya, go ahead. Good evening, Pastor Tim and classmates. Uh, it, uh, actually, on the real, I'll be honest, we were not able to discuss that much. And again, the same as Pastor Anthem's <laughs> reason, but it's okay. Uh, 
uh, we we try to discuss each principle, but then we uh, I think Tito Bubo, you have a question in Tree of Life. I don't know if you would like to share it because we haven't discussed it. But I what uh, I was sharing actually is about the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil, uh, the principle of probation, and it's actually as well written in my uh, in my paper. And with that, I have observed that. Uh, because I was telling them that before I was thinking that the tree of knowledge of good and evil, its fruit has this kind of power that when you eat it, you're going to, oh, this is good and this is bad. And then I realized from reading what Voss, what Voss was saying is that it's actually the test. It's the act. Yeah. It's yeah. the act that would determine, determine and that it's the test of obedience. So, and you you actually disobey God's commandment, then that will then that action will result for you for reality to dawn into you that what you did is bad. What you did is against God's will. So there, that's it. We we stopped in that part. Good. Okay. No, that's really good. And and I really liked I really liked your observation. That was hard for me as well. To, to really understand because he's not as clear, but this idea that there is this wrong view that it's like magical in some way, or maybe perhaps the, 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 the serpent was offering this magical type, but he's saying that's that it was, it was, it was a bad, it, it was, it was not the correct understanding of what the fruit is. It, it it's in the test itself. And so, yeah, I, I, and I agree, I agree with that as well. So great observation. Kuya Bobo, you had a question. Yes, uh, before my question, I have to make a comment because I, I intimated to you that I have this uh, lingering idea why why Boss was using, uh, what, they, what they call it, me, mythical, was that interpretation? Or was that my question? Allegorical, allegorical, allegorical uh, interpretation. Mythical, he used mythical, the word mythical, mythical. interpretation. He used the mythical interpretation uh, to explain the tree of the good and evil. So I'm just wondering why why should a boss use this mythical when you know it's just a myth, and then later on explain the concept of the the of that of that concept from the point of view of the tempter, the 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 the, the serpent. So I'm just wondering. Although there is some there is some uh points good point to consider but why why use the side of satan to explain this concept although he okay. said yeah. one point of satan is from the point of view of envy so why why use the the side of satan to explain that concept and of course my my other question is uh what is the real significance of death through the dissolution of the physical body, uh, although it was under another principle, but I'm just wondering why why is this uh, uh, discussed in terms? I think this is in terms of the death uh, from the tree of knowledge. We say when you uh, eat of the fruit, you will surely die. So I think uh, both uh, connected this death to the. Uh, dissolution of the physical body. I think that was what he was explaining. That's why I have another question that before the fall, was physical death feasible? Yeah, so so let's yeah, so let's <laughs> let's think about these questions. You know, I did struggle, I did struggle myself trying to really understand what Voss was saying, especially on point number four. So it was hard to follow what he was saying. I do think the last paragraph really summarizes his points. So if we have time, we can go back and, and, and look at these. What we're going to do though, is we're gonna look at what the boss's summary statements are. And then we're gonna look at how the word of God describes the real significance of death. Because remember, boss is not, is not in one, uh, anyway. He's not making just stuff up. What he's doing is he, he, he's looking at Genesis and then he's comparing it to how the Bible 
interprets gen the Genesis events. That leads us back to the question concerning allegorical interpretation. And number one, is it really allegorical interpretation or is it um, typological interpretation? And there's a big difference. And from last week, where from last week, from our study, so remember our introductory issues, our foundation, how does our discussion from last week, what passage brings in direct significance to, to this question? What passage and what was the, what was it, what was stated there that, that might bring us into a position to consider this more deeply, someone? Can, can you repeat the question, Dean? Yeah, so the question is last week, there was, there was a passage, a passage of scripture that we looked at that has a comparison, it has words, it has terminologies that might, that might shed light into this, to this question number one, allegorical or something else, or Voss uses a uh, symbol. Well, the, the word for, that Voss uses is symbol. Does anyone recall a word or words, a, a passage of scripture that would help us? What is the relationship between the Old and New Testaments or the Old and New Covenant? What is that relationship? Typology. Typology, or we can say uh, um, the word is, yeah, yeah, but yeah, no, the first was, I liked it. The relationship is that of type, shadow, pattern. So this is explicitly coming from Hebrews chapter 8. Is everyone tracking there with me? So, and this is concerning, this is concerning... Old Covenant and New Covenant. There's a relationship here, okay? So this does this does put so 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 maybe perhaps people would say, well, it's it's allegorical, okay? And and a lot of people will say that. So 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 this is this is a typical <laughs> typical. This is this is a, a statement by made by many theologians, especially those of different things. Okay, so the observation you're making about the allegorical is not something unique. It is it is a, a typical criticism. Okay, but but the question remains: Are there other examples of symbolism in the Old Testament? And if so, what are they? Just before we get into our notes, are there is there any other literal event? literal thing that that is meant to signify something great it's meant to symbolize something greater A anywhere in the old testament can you think of anything exodus noah's ark exodus yeah exodus okay so exodus right the the the, the, the good just Jesus, oh, go ahead uh, yeah uh when moses uh, lift, lifted up the 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 I can't think. I forgot the words. The, lifted the up the, 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 the serpent in the wilderness. So the Son of Man yeah. will be lifted up, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. So that's good. So, so, so that being lifted up, the serpent being lifted up was to symbolize, it was a literal event. Okay, literal event, but it symbolized something greater. Noah's Ark, Kaya mentioned Noah's Ark. How is it, how is it, how is it symbolic, Kaya? Yes, Pastor Tim. Uh, Noah's Ark, it symbolizes uh, baptism. Baptism! Explicit! First Peter 3 and 4. Explicit. It's a type, okay? So, so coming back to Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, okay, I think that we're actually going to see, we're actually going to see that there's, act, the, the scripture views these ideas as symbolic for greater truths, okay? So I want you to see it in the text itself, how scripture, how, how the word of God uses it. But what, what I'm trying to get at is that there are other examples in the Old Testament that are non-negotiably symbolic. The lamb, the sacrificial lamb is 
a thousand percent symbolic of the lamb of Christ. Christ is the greater lamb, okay? Um, the, the temple, <laughs> the, the, um, <laughs> right? The cloud, manna. So there's a lot of different events, things are to sim that symbolize non-negotiable. You can't negotiate with them. It, it's, it's, it's a reality, okay? And so if, if that's the case, it, it's inappropriate for us to just um, a priori, that means without investigation, is just going to it beforehand and just remove, remove everything. We have, to, we have to look at the symbolic, is there symbolic, is there symbolism in the text? Is there a typological interpretation? But it's not forced. Allegorical is coming from the own mind. Typological and sy symbolic uh, symbolism is coming from the closed canon itself, okay? So I, I hope everyone's seeing that. And that's why the framework is so important. If we understand the framework of old covenant, new covenant, shadow and types, promise fulfillment, we can look elsewhere and, and follow those existing patterns, okay? So uh, Jesus's question is an excellent question and observation. Absolutely excellent. Okay. At the same time, though, we need to be we need to be vigilant because perhaps there is some symbolism. We just don't uh, to just remove all the symbolism without an investigation is actually to be engaged in a form of interpretation that is not being faithful to the text. So, in some ways, your interpretation, uh, if it doesn't consider symbolism, doesn't consider typology, is actually falling into the same trap as allegorical. You're, you're coming to the text with, with, with uh, a preconceived agenda and not allowing it to inform us. Okay, so um, that's all I'm going to say. Okay, any questions or comments? Does someone else want to add before we move on? Does someone else want to add? Um, all right, it's seven o'clock. What I'm going to do is we started 10 minutes late, so let's begin the PowerPoint. We're, we'll do the PowerPoint for 10 minutes and then take a break. Okay, um, any last question really quick? We're kind of we're at the limit of time. Any any serious question or is, is everyone yes. tracking? So yes. yeah, go ahead, Cody Boy. Why, why is there no resolution as to what is really are we talking about? Is it really allegorical? As you said, there are debate. Is it typological or symbolism? Although yeah, so we're going to discuss it. We're, we're, but yeah. there seems to be no final resolution. Everybody can interpret it as allegorical. Somebody says it's so is there really uh, a resolution to this debate as to what is really is that? Yeah, okay. So the simplest answer is that I, now I would say this, I am partial, but I would say within the reform framework, <laughs> there's a resolution. I mean to say that within the, the, the reformers, there is there's a line of interpretation that goes all the way back to the first century that's consistent. And so you see the same symbolisms being taught consistently. You would be shocked at how Voss is not picking some of these things are original to Voss, others are not. He's he will look at earlier Protestant uh, scholars in the the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. It's also in the early church fathers, Augustine and others. So the simple answer is there is there is a line that's consistent, Koyo Boboy, of this of this interpretation. It is debated because there's so many factors involved. So Koyo Boboy, let's maybe let's consider that. Let's continue that question after this lecture, and maybe once we have the lecture, um, then we could have that. That's a broader question that we can discuss. That's a, that's a broader question that we can discuss. Yeah, great. All right, we're going to go ahead and and let's go back to the PowerPoint. So I shared notes. So if you printed out the notes, um, the notes will will follow the PowerPoint here. So let's go to back to the PowerPoint. Okay. So biblical theology, chapter three, the mode and content of pre-redemptive special revelation. And so in, in the, the, the first major uh, point in our outline was the introductory issues. Actually, um, we we included chapters uh, chapters one and two as one, and um, it, you know I went back and forth on this. I think in the handout I actually have this as point number major point number three, 
So you could do both. I might just keep it as point number two because the introductory issues can, can, can also um, uh, include mapping. So in your in your handout, just just it should be Roman numeral number two, not not Roman numeral number three. Okay. And so first, we're looking at the mode and content of special revelation in the Old Testament. So this is the first major point in our outline of looking at the framework of special revelation. Okay. And so we're looking at the mode and content of special revelation in the Old Testament. And specifically now we're looking at the pre-redemptive special revelation era, pre-redemptive special revelation era. Okay. And so right now we're looking at uh, point number small a, which is overview of description and mode. So before we get in, I do want to make several, I'm making several clarifications and caveats just to, just to bring clarity to us. Um, and so the first caveat I have is this, uh, because no doubt someone has this in their mind. And I had this in my mind as well. Um, we must clarify and emphasize that Voss's use of religion, state of religion, religious experience, this vocabulary is not to be understood in a negative sense but in a positive sense as describing man's intercourse communication with God. So in, especially in our day, in our context, in our church context, when you say religion, that's a segue to presenting the gospel, right? Anyone who has religion is not a believer. <laughs> it's kind of like that's the way it works. So religion is a naughty word. Religion is like a Pharisee. It's not, it's not a good word, but, but actually religion in its, in its, uh, um, in its original context was a positive was a positive word to be used and actually scripturally speaking um, pure religion according to James is to control the tongue and to visit the widows and their uh, and orphans in their affliction okay so uh, even the scripture talks very highly about religion so you know religion can be bad it can be used wrongly people can abuse it but every word let me just emphasize this every word that is in that is in uh, theological terms, that is in Christianity, has been abused. So Christian's a word that's been abused. Belief has been a word that's been abused. Christ, son of God, religion, everything. So um, everything has been abused, okay? Uh, the other point, we're not going to get into it. I forgot to actually put up there is the idea of sacrament. We also think of sacrament in a very negative sense, but, but the way Voss defines sacrament the way he uses sacrament is this idea of it's an outward sign that signifies um, uh, inward grace that's being given to us. Okay. So the sacrament is not giving grace. It's just an outward sign that's signifying the presence of, of inward grace. So he would say that the Lord's supper is just an outward sign of the presence of of salvific grace in us. So it's not giving grace. Okay. So when that's when, 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 when boss is using sacrament, he's not using it in a works based religious context of the Catholic church. Okay. So again, I just want to be clear, um, uh, especially historical theologians, as you read, you'll have these like naughty words in our context, but they weren't naughty words or they weren't bad words, theologically speaking in the history. It's just, um, words that have been used over abused over the the centuries and then finally in our day many baptists you know we're baptists we're pentecostal they're like okay get these words out they're bad words they're bad words okay so so it's kind of that's kind of how that works okay everyone tracking with sir, me Does someone want to ask a question go ahead yes sir uh just to clarify also is the sacraments that uh, Voss is using here is like the same with what we call ordinances yeah so yeah so so well you, you not in that precise way, because when you when he refers to there, he refers to sacraments in in the garden. So again, if we understand the term as let, let me, I have a technical definition here. Let me let me read it for us. Just bear with me here. Let me let me just read this this technical definition. I think it'll really help bring clarity here. So um, this word sacrament actually comes from the Greek word mysterion. And so it's Latin sacramentum or oath. And these are outward signs instituted by God to convey an inward or spiritual grace. So it's, it's not giving grace. Now, 
some in 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 the religious context and in, in, will say that they actually give they impart grace but in its most fundamental sense it, it it it's just signifying the presence of an inward grace so the lord's supper signifies the presence of christ's sacrifice that he did on the cross okay so that would be an example but he's not using it in the technical sense so there's other outward signs throughout redemptive history throughout revelation special revelation that god gives that signifies of that inward grace that we have okay um so there's 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 more than that but concerning church orthopraxy they come to us now primarily in the lord's supper in baptism but again they're not imparting salvific grace okay and for sure not in, in a catholic sense so again i just want to i want to add that caveat so that we're not misreading we're not misreading boss okay it's because we can, it can become very easy to misread boss okay let's look at this next quote here and then we'll take a break okay um everything connected with this disclosure so it's pre-fall is exceedingly primitive it is largely symbolical okay that is not expressed in words so much as tokens and these tokens partake of the general character of biblical symbolism in that besides being the means of instruction they are also typical <laughs> so we got so so um that is sacramental uh that is prefigurations conveying assurance concerning future realization of the things symbolized so uh allegorical interpretation has if you took if you took uh interpret history of interpretation everyone had hermeneutics right everyone here should have had hermeneutics most most a few maybe have not um looking at the history of interpretation when did allegorical interpretation begin roughly speaking how long ago did allegorical interpretation begin anyone bring it to mind i think it's more uh, allegorical is more in literal sense or that's what i yeah, but remember I'm saying, text. but but jesus the, the, the time period how long ago did it begin how many centuries ago did it begin yeah i think started in plato <laughs> yeah yeah it was so it's going all the way back so what i'm trying to say is that allegorical has been around almost as long as the bible okay so what i'm trying to get at is that it's been it's been around it was in plato it's in josephus it's in philo it's in the jews the 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 the, the, the rabbinic the rabbinic schools right diba uh post biblical judaism um intertestamental period it was in the church fathers so what i'm trying to get at here is that uh Voss knows and he's a scholar he knows about allegorical interpretation so um perhaps you would disagree with his interpretations maybe you think they're allegorical but here this is explicitly from his words so he's not in his mind he's not using an allegorical interpretation he's saying that there are symbolic and so God is not speaking in words, but he's signifying truths at this point in revelation in, in events, in tokens, okay? And these are gonna point forward to uh, the revelation later on. So, okay, so, and, and, and this, this is anticipatory, right? We talked about, we already know according to the gospel that things have been hidden. So this will be something that, not hidden in the allegorical sense, but in the framework sense, okay? So, so allegorical is going too far. A wooden literal interpretation is not far enough, okay? So um, I hope that we see, we see that here. And, and his statement is it's typical, sacramental, it's a prefiguration, and it's pointing to future realization, okay? And so, yeah, it's, we, we, just have to, we just have to balance. We have to balance and... Um, uh, yeah, so let's see now. So our job is to look at Voss's uh, significances that he make, his principles, and then we need to compare it to scripture. Does that fit the biblical framework? Does that fit other parts of scripture? Okay, so that's the task for us tonight. The symbolism, however, does not lie in account as literary form, which would involve denial of the historical reality of the transaction. It is real symbolism embodied in actual things 
So this gets to Sonny's question. Trump or Longman built Bruce Waltke, they're wrong. I'm sorry, I, I mean, they're wrong according to Voss. I mean, at the end of the day, it's not because of Voss, it's, it's whether the word of God says it or not, but Voss would not be in line with them. They could not claim being with Voss. Voss would not want to be associated with them because fundamentally Voss sees these as real things symbolizing greater things. And that's quite significant. If, if, if these things are real, you can have more assurance that the future realization will come into reality, okay? If someone's like, it doesn't matter whether it happened or not, it's just the message. You know, does everyone, has everyone seen Lord of the Rings, Hobbit and Lord of the Rings? Has everyone seen that? Who has not seen Hobbit or Lord of the Rings? They, it, Lord of the Rings and Hobbit, it has profound statements. It teaches a great message. At the end of the day, no one takes it seriously because it's not real. <laughs> Correct. It's like, oh, it's a great story. But even if it's teaching truths, we don't really take it seriously because it's not real. It's, 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 it's pure story. Okay. Um, now we as Christians see that that's also personifying. It's, it's, it's an allegorical, it's an allegory. It's picking up on a lot of Christian truths that we do take as real. And so it has a greater significance for us. But if there's, if it's not, re if it's not real, you know, for me, I don't really care. So that's the significance of emphasizing um, historical reality. And, and Voss is really big on this. Okay. So he, he's not, he doesn't see this, the, the serpent as, as, as symbolic, uh, only symbolic. He sees it as real and symbolic. He sees, creation as real and symbolic. He, he sees what God doing in creation, in the garden, as both real, yet he is uh, teaching us truth symbolically to greater realities, okay? And so when the, rea the greater reality comes, you're like, wow, <laughs> all wise God. He's an all wise God, okay? Okay, let's go ahead and um, Let's take a break right there. Let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll continue on. Okay, let's take a 10 minute break. So tonight we will see examples. We will see examples of this. Okay, so I, I promise you. And I, I, I will quote Voss. I will quote Voss what he says so that you also see that he is forming his conclusions from scripture, but he doesn't spend a lot of time explaining it's the, the scripture is just a, a, a proof text, but he doesn't exp, explain it partially because what Sonny said that he is interacting with liberals and they all know the scripture. So it's not an issue of trying to explain something to them because even many of these scholars, they, they, they know large portions of the scripture. So you could just reference Psalm one and they automatically know what's going on. So it's also the level of where he's geared to. This is, this is geared towards uh, more scholarly people that are very familiar with the word of God. This is not lay level. So I, I do want to be clear on that. This is not lay level, okay? I would not give this reading to a lay level or someone who is a beginner of the word. This is not for discipleship. <laughs> This is not, if you did that, I would go over there and, and I'm like, what are you doing? This is not, this is not for... Oh my goodness. In me. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, let's, let's go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so, all right. So, moving along. Um, I am including uh, the mode, even though Voss doesn't really talk on it, because it is important. It is important to see. And um, I think he mentions it before in chapter two. So, but I just want to emphasize here. So, um, the mode is direct speech from God to man. Right. So in your homework assignment, you should have seen that. Right. There is direct speaking. There's no reference to an angel. There's no reference to any type of intermediate relationship. It's just direct. Correct. Everyone tracking there. So it's direct speech. Um, God speaks six times in the creation event and and in the speaking creation happens. So the word of God is revealed to be all powerful. God's power is in his word. Okay. And so there is a connection then with natural revelation and special revelation because, and Voss talks about this. And I think we mentioned this last week is this idea that 
um, God is speaking his creation into existence. Okay. And so this is, this is signifying how powerful the word is. And it is through his word that he acts. And so throughout the, throughout um, the judgments are through his, his word in Exodus, um, in the prophets, there's multiple references to, to the powerful word in, in, Hebrews 1, 1 to 4, it refers to that Jesus, the one by which he speaks, maintains the world through his powerful word. So it's this word of God that is all powerful. And this is the mode we're seeing, we're seeing just speaking. Okay. Um, and then he speaks directly to man and women, uh, to man and woman, mankind. And this, this speaking includes, you should have seen this. People don't really pick up on this. There's a blessing, right? There's a blessing. There's, there's a commissioning, right? There's, there's, there are commands given. There, there's a prohibition, there's promise, and there's also a warning. So if we have time or if you have a question, well, let's just take a moment right now. Looking at your homework assignment, did everyone see that? Do you have any questions? You see, you see all of these different ways in which God, different types of communication, uh, words that he's giving to man. Any questions or comments on that? So the point of the assignment was for us to see this, okay? The point was for us to see this. Four principles. So he, he pulls up four principles. We're going to look at each one of them. There are four principles, okay? So he's going to give us four principles. Um, now this is my interpretation. Perhaps you would disagree with me and it's fine if you do. I'm not, you know, don't feel pressured. It will not affect your grade. If you choose differently, that's fair enough. But I don't, from his own words, I think to be fair, at least he's not intentionally trying to do allegorical interpretation. At least we can say that from his own words, which I quoted earlier, he's not trying to do allegorical, but rather typological interpretation. And, and the way that we can be sure of this is that the images and symbols that he is describing reappear in scripture, in wisdom literature, in the law. I don't have the law mentioned there, but in the law, in the prophets, in the Psalms, in the gospels, in the epistles, and in the revelation of Jesus Christ. These symbols continue to crop up. And actually throughout scripture, they're pointing back to that first, uh, the first prototype, the first, the, 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 the token in Genesis, they both point back but they also point forward. They point forward to, to Revelation 22, 21 and 22. And I hope you're going to see that tonight. Okay. Um, the correctness of this is verified by the occurrence of this piece of symbolism. So this is Voss. So Voss is validating his exegetical statements. And this is his val validation. So you, so you, I want you to think about this is this is where the rubber meets the road, okay? Either he's right or wrong, all right? The correctness of this is verified by the reoccurrence of this piece of symbolism in eschatological form or, or end time form at the end of history, where there can be no doubt concerning the principles of paradise being the habitation of God, where he dwells in order to make man dwell with himself. So in this quotation, he doesn't reference explicitly revelation 21 and 22 but no one would say that that's not what he's referring to okay so perhaps he could have spent more time explaining it but he but but the, the statement is go and look at the end and there's no doubt and i think when we actually look when we actually look at the end i think that we would say yes there's no doubt this is very clear okay um so the the four principles. So what are these four principles? You started talking about them. The first principle is the principle of life. The second principle is the principle of probation. The third principle is the principle of temptation and sin. I include testing because the testing is also connected with the probation. Uh, maybe we don't want to use temptation next to testing. Um, uh, oftentimes though, what God is using as a testing for confirmation, Satan is using as temptation to sin. Okay, so that's why I've combined the two. Okay, and so what is what is good 
and, and, and a gift from God to, to strengthen, to mature our faith, to bring us to spiritual maturity, uh, uh, Satan is trying to use to tempt us. And so that's why I'm including the, this tempting and testing, not that God is also tempting. He doesn't tempt, nor can he be tempted. Some great man once said that. <laughs> Some place once said that. Okay, so I don't know where. I don't know where. Okay. Um, and then number four, the principle of death. The principle of death. Okay. All right. Principle of life. So now we're into it. Now we're into it. So the question is, non-negotiably, there is the presence of the physical, which Voss would say is real. The physical tree of life. The tree of life stands in the midst of the garden, quoting Voss. The garden is the garden of God, not in the first instance an abode of man as such, but specifically a place of reception of man into fellowship with God in God's own dwelling place. So now he now he 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 gives he he gives several references here. I added more. So the scripture references in if you look in your Bible, he looks at Genesis three twenty two. He he does he he talks about that. He also talks about Ezekiel twenty eight thirteen and sixteen, and also I added Proverbs three eighteen eleven thirty and fifteen four, and then he refers to the revelation of Jesus Christ, Revelation two. 7, 21, 6, 22, 4, 14, and 19, okay? With this tree of life being fundamentally an abode of God in a place where man comes and meets with God in fellowship, but it's God's own dwelling place. It's not our dwelling place. Um, we're going to see if that's the case. Uh, Pastor Enting, you want to make a statement? Yeah, um... Uh, I just want to to add into the the discussion team because the confusion earlier when it comes to if this is symbolism or allegorical, um, I I think the the uh, uh, the challenge is really to see this in light of the big picture, in light of the whole scripture, because uh, we cannot interpret this as allegorical because it it surfaces again and again yeah. in the whole of scripture so that the idea is not coming outside of scripture the idea yeah. is also coming from the scripture and and that is yeah. why this could not be interpreted as allegorical yeah. but rather symbolism and this is true to not just principle one but, but the rest of yeah. uh, the other principles that yeah. that was uh, cited no, excellent. So, so I'm going to piggyback with what Pastor Enting said. So, for example, for example, we would not, when we see the lamb, the Passover lamb, no one would say, oh, when, when, when you preach on the Passover lamb in Exodus, I would hope that you're, that you're connecting that with Christ, that Christ is the greater Passover lamb, okay? So in that instance, the physical, now the text doesn't say this is going to be Jesus Christ who's going to die on the cross, right? The text doesn't say that. Okay, so that's what that's what I think saying. It doesn't say that. The, the event, the, the sacrifice is symbolic. It's teaching something greater so that when the, the, the eternal Lamb of God comes and sacrifices with eternal blood, we say, oh, that's why God did that. Okay, so there's the connection there. It's not allegorical. You see it in context. So what I'm trying to say is no one would disagree with that. We would all say, amen, preach it. Okay. So what I want, I'm trying to get us to open our minds is that if that is appropriate, what prevents us from not making, if, 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 this, if, a, if a similar connection is present in scripture between some other concept and, and, and token, what prevents us? You can't say, oh, we don't believe in allegorical interpretation, so we can't include it. But you've already conceded that there's other instances where it's like that. Do you see what I'm saying? So that's what it means by, um, a priori, without the evidence, you're automatically saying we have to discredit it, okay? Um, so so I, I hope everyone's tracking there. I'm ho I hope that I'm making sense with what Pastor Enting is saying. So again, what he's, he's emphasizing and what I want to emphasize is that this is the framework of Scripture. And so if it's there, if we're seeing these things, then we, we, 
we have to look at the merits in the text itself and comparing the two to see if it's justified or not. We can't, um, we can't simply say, no, we can't do it because the text doesn't say it. In many other instances, the text doesn't say it, yet there is that connection. So is, is, is anyone else want to add? Anyone else want to push back? Uh, feel free to push back. I, I, I don't want anyone to feel pressured. You, you are free to say any, uh, within the context of this class and within, uh, uh, we, we, can, we can share our, our thoughts. Any questions or, or someone want to push back? I did not hear. I did not see any, any hands. Okay, so let's look at the text. Let's look at the text and let's see if this, this idea of tree of life, this literal tree of life is symbolic uh, for something greater. And I just want I just want to be I just want to be clear. In the context, you should have read it. I'm not going to read it at this point, but every, everyone is clear that the tree of life, there's nowhere in the tree of life that refers to it as the tree of eternal life. Is everyone clear there? Okay. Um, so in, in the original context, let me um let me just I'm gonna bring it up on the screen. Okay. L let's let me go ahead and let me bring up let's look at these passages, these passages of scripture. Let's, let's really set the table. So everyone is tracking with what's going on here. Okay. Okay. So um, let's come out here. So I just want to go down to Genesis chapter two, out of the ground, out of the ground, the Lord made to spring up every tree that is pleasant. Every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life is in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, okay? So this is the, the one lone reference to the tree of life. I'm gonna use green just to really emphasize the, the tree of life. But notice here, there is no statement to, There's no reference here in this context to eternal life, okay? Everyone tracking with me? So it, it does mean that you will not physically die, but it's not signifying something even greater, okay? Which is what I think we're going to see, okay? So let's go ahead and let's look at these other passages of Scripture here, okay? So what I want to go first to is uh, Genesis 3. The Lord said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out and also take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So um, this is, this is a, another reference to now the significance of what the tree of life was offering, which is which is this idea of, of life, but in this state. So does, does everyone understand, and we should all think about this, that there is a greater, there is a greater state, there's a greater state that because of the coming of Christ, that is beyond this. So if, if Adam were to live forever in his fallen state, um, it's, 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 if you can imagine, it's two different levels. Does everyone see that? If you're looking here at, at time. This physical and... Um, So this is partly what, okay, so good. Okay, so this is partly what I'm referring to that, that um, even in, even if he was to live um, uh, forever, it is in this, it, it is, it is in this, um, I think the words that Voss use are, it, it's in a, it's not in this highest of blessed state. Does everyone see that? So even if he were to live, even if he weren't to die, even if, if, even if he was confirmed in, 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 in life, 
it, it's 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 at this lower level. Okay, is everyone tracking? That's why Voss talks about even post redemption, our relationship is is at a whole different level. Now 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 what it, what is one proof of this, which is so profound? What is what is one proof that we know that even if Adam had never died, his state of living forever is still a lower. It's a lower. It's not the same state of blessedness that we have now. So this is why Voss talks about there's even a greater. Uh, the redemption is even greater than the original state, right? He talked about that. Viva. What is one just clear evidence that it's at, at, we, we're experiencing something greater that Adam would have never experienced, even if he had not fallen. What is that? Some, someone give it to me. It's common. Pentecostals it's, love it. It's the eternal life. Yeah. Okay. Yes. But even something more clear than that, because people could say, oh, well, Adam was going to have eternal life. What is, what is, um, what is one thing that is just it signifies that our state is so much beyond what Adam could have experienced. What is that? Two, two things. Number one, union with Christ. And by implication with this uh, indwelling of God. Holy Spirit. <laughs> He's inside of us. It's in this greater state. Okay, so what I'm trying to get at here is that, and this is what Voss is, maybe he doesn't making, isn't making all these, connecting all these dots, but in this original event and events, it's at this lower level. The, the, the tree of life is, is symbolizing something so much greater. It's pointing to something, I should be going this way, something so much greater, so much beyond. It's this principle that's going to be, be realized in multiple trajectories and moving towards Revelation 22, okay? What I'm trying to get at is that eternal life that we have now in Christ is, is, is not in this original text, okay? Does everyone see that? It, it, this is all physical. It's all literal. It is not yet pointing to this greater reality that we have. Okay, is everyone tracking? Let me take a minute. To, I don't want to lose anybody. I hope everyone sees this. Uh, yeah, Tim, <clears throat> Tim, I can see it because if, if let's say, if Adam did not disobey God, yeah. if Adam did not obey, disobey God, in verse 22, Genesis 3, 22, God said, the man is now become how has now become like one of us without a spirit <laughs> yeah that's without the spirit not, that is not indwelling yeah. yeah yeah it's what we have now is far more better than yes. what Adam has so so big takeaway anyone say like why would god allow this you have an answer. You have at least one answer. <laughs> Why God would allow man to sin? You have an answer. Maybe we don't know, but that that could be. It could be. Okay. <laughs> so singing. All right. Let's look at the next passage of scripture here. Okay. Um, let's go now to Proverbs. Okay. There was. I, I gave three passages. I gave the passages I gave for us are um, Proverbs uh, three. Uh, Proverbs three. 18, 11, 30, and also 15, 4. We don't have time to go to all of them. We cannot go to all of them, okay? I just have this example here, okay? So this is a different trajectory, okay? So this is not in the same sense of Genesis chapter 3, but the principle is there, okay? And there's many other examples. This, I believe this is also in... This is this principle also is is in the law. I haven't even gone to the law now. I did not go to the law because Voss does not pick up on it. Although life is promised in the law, divine physical blessing in life. So we we could go there as well. Okay, there's a lot of other other biblical theologians go there. But let, look at this one example here. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than the gain from silver, and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire can compare to her. Long life is her right hand. So this is wisdom, okay? This is wisdom. Um, 
Her ways are the ways of pleasantness and her paths are the paths of peace. She is a tree of life. <laughs> oh my goodness. She is a tree of life. And those who lay hold of her, those who hold fast are called blessed. So however else you look at this, God through his servant Solomon is picking up on this principle of the tree of life. And whereas wisdom of our own is in the knowledge of good and evil, and it leads, it leads to, to independence, autonomy, and, and, and sin and wickedness, um, God has given wisdom to us now, right? The tree of life is benefiting us now in wisdom. It's, it's, in, it's in a temporal, even with us going to experience death, there is this principle that's true in Proverbs, in wisdom literature. Is everyone tracking there with me? This is another form of the principle of the tree of life being played out temporally. Okay. A any questions or comments? Maybe someone missed that. Let's just take a question. Let's just take a minute to ask a question. Okay. Let's go on here. Next, next, next. So now we're getting to um, Voss's statement. This also is going to answer a clear bull boy's question. I think uh, this is referring to, to Satan. You were in the Eden, the garden of God. So Voss quotes this to say that fundamentally Eden is not, Eden is not a, uh, a place for man, but the garden of God. It's, 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 God, it's God's dwelling place. How can we know that from the original context? How can we say, yes, Ezekiel is right in, in saying this, and, and, and this is a, a right truth? How do we know that, going back to Genesis 3, how do we know that fundamentally the Garden of Eden is, is more fundamentally a place of God, is, is, more is more fundamentally a place of God than, than a place for man? How do we know that in the original context? Someone give me a, a reason that we know that the Garden of Eden is fundamentally about God and not man. They, they were sent away from the Garden after the fall. Yes, they were kicked out. The one, the one who owns the house, he kicks the person out that's the troublemaker, right? God kicks him out of his house. It's like, bar the door. <laughs> It's a, it's a dwelling place of God. <clears throat> Reformed theology, it's primarily about God, not about man. When, when we interpret Eden as a place for man, we are now interpreting focused on a man-centered interpretation, not a God-centered, okay? Uh, <clears throat> moving along here. Every precious stone was your covering. So this is referring to, to Satan. Sardis, topaz, diamond, bar, um, barrel, um, I think that's how you say it. I might, maybe I got that wrong. Topaz, diamond, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle. <clears throat> Crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. So this is, this is referring to Satan, the dragon, um, uh, the creation of the angelic being of, of, of Satan. Okay. Uh, you are anointed as a guardian ch uh, cherub. Um, I placed you. You were on the mountain of God. So look at this. So this is... <laughs> look at this. The mountain of God was also present in the garden. Is everyone tracking there with me? Although it was not accented, it's there. So that's why the two are merged. These two images are merged together. Garden of God and also the mountain of God. So throughout, throughout scripture, you'll hear about that Israel is going to be planted on his mountain. Isaiah 2, from the mountain of God, from Zion, the law will go out. <laughs> so this theme of garden and mountain are both present, although what's accented in Genesis uh, chapter uh, two, the 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 garden is accented. This is the this is the exegetical proof for emphasizing going back to the quotation that in the first instance 
the, the garden is not the abode of man, but the place of reception of, of, of man into fellowship with God in God's own dwelling place. Okay, so this is explicit. Um, okay, and, and, and in connection with this, um, um, the, the teaching is in, so just to be clear, because of those issues, the, this teaching is in the background. Okay, so this, this statement that Voss is making, this is in the background. Okay, so in the, in the foreground, okay, in the foreground, the primary teaching is, is, is dealing with the king of Tyre. Okay. But in order to address the king of Tyre, this must be true. Okay, is everyone tracking with me? So whenever we're studying theology, sometimes a text is primarily teaching on a topic or something must be true in the background in order for it to be true. Okay, so here it's in the background, but it's true nonetheless. Does someone want to make a question or a comment? Is everyone tracking with what I'm saying there? All right, good. All right, um, let's move on now. Okay, so, so, so there, there are more examples uh, of this tree of life. We're, we're going to move quickly. To, to, to Revelation, Revelation chapter 2. Um, so we're looking at Revelation 2, chapter 21, chapter 22, okay? Um, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So again, you have this, this tree of life, right? And it's not in man's place, right? It's in, it's in the paradise of God. So this is the description. Now, is this in the original context or in the eschatological context? <laughs> Does everyone see? It would be offensive for us to be going back, for us to go back and eat. It would be offensive for us to go back to eat from uh, Eden's Eden's tree. Does everyone see that? This is it's being transformed. This is now speaking to the the uh, the eternal life that's being given. Okay, it's going beyond. Okay, so I hope we see this. There's multiple layers to this. This is, but if we have the framework, no problem. This is why liberals will say, see, they're all, they're all confused. It's just, it's just man's ramblings. And we say, no, um, if you have the biblical theological framework, if we interpret in context, so if we interpret it exegetically, we also look at it biblical theologically, um, because the biblical theological is part of the exegetical process, so it's there, and we have this framework, it all fits. When we start taking out different parts, everything collapses, okay? Revelation 21, 5, and, and he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the springs of water of life. <laughs> so this here, we're going to come back to that. Okay, we're coming back to this. Okay, we're coming back to that. That's the principle of the, of the water of life. <laughs> okay, it's a different image the, teaching the same thing. Okay, um, without payment. To the one who conquers, I will have this heritage. I will be his God and he will be his son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the idolaters, the sexual immoral, the sorcerers, and liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So I, I apologize here. So this is picking up on this, this water of life is also picking up on this eternal life significance. So um, I apologize. Uh, th this is referring to it's the it's the it's the symbolism of of water signifying the greater the greater truth. Okay. <laughs> Lastly, uh, I'll just read through this. Revelation twenty two one. Then the angel showed me a river 
of the water of life. So again, it's coming back, the river of the water of life. Bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb and through the street of the city. <laughs> On either side of the river, there's two tree of life now. There's two of them. Tree of life with 12 kinds of fruit. It's not one. There's 12 kinds of fruit yielding fruit in each month. So think about this for a second, right? Diba, everyone knows this. Mango is in season, out of season. Sayang when it's out of season. Diba is so mahal and they don't always have stock, right? Notice, notice this. <laughs> 12 kinds of fruit that's every month. <laughs> All the time. And oh my goodness. So powerful, the imagery. And it's pointing to this eternal life principle. We have a reference to God, the Lamb. Where is the Spirit? Where is the Spirit? Logically, think about it. Where is the Spirit? In us. The Spirit is in us. Dwelling in us. So God is dwelling with man. We are dwelling in God's uh, in God, it's God's throne. <laughs> it's not us. In the presence of God in its fullest sense. God is there. The Son is there. And His Spirit is living in us. This is so much better. This is so much better than the Garden of Eden. So in one sense, when we say from, from, from Eden to Eden, that's wrong. <laughs> in one sense, saying from Eden back to Eden, it's, it's, it's like, it's not like this. It's not, um, let's just say this is the garden here. It's not coming back to the garden, okay? Let me, we're not, this is in time, Diba. It's like, it's so much greater. Let's let's change this. This is wrong here. I shouldn't say this. This is the the paradise. Paradise of God. Paradise of God. No comparison. <laughs> it's a different level. It's a different level. So let's just finish up here. Blessed are those who wash their robes so they may have a right to eat of the tree of life. So in Revelation, there is a huge accent on the tree of life, okay? Um, but this is, this is a, a principle throughout all of Scripture because, because of the emphasis upon because of the emphasis, what Voss says is the emphasis upon the principle of life is everyone tracking that's why if you just look at this idea of tree of life maybe it's not as extended throughout but if we look at this principle of life it is all through the scripture and it begins in the garden this principle of life and it's in the presence of god you cannot separate this from the presence of god Okay, it is 8.14. Let's ask a question. If you want to take a minute, let's ask a question. We still have to finish principle one, so maybe we won't finish tonight. I don't know. We're going to try. Any questions or comments, or maybe you have an observation that you want to add? Let's take a minute before we take a break. Question, Pastor Steve. Yeah. Good. Uh, paradise means uh, that's... Uh, uh, where is paradise? Is it in heaven or is it on, on earth? Yeah. So, so um, uh, if you look at Revelation 21 to 22, this here is time. This, this, this here is not, I'm not referring here to location. 
this is not location, okay? I'm referring to um, uh, uh, quality of, in the words of Voss, blessedness. <laughs> Or we could say um, uh, new creation. Uh, compared with creation, okay? We could say old. So is everyone tracking here? Is everyone tracking there with me? So we should not be, so what I'm trying to get to answer Danny's question is, in Revelation, the new Jerusalem comes to earth. So, so what we see at the end is the merging of, of the heaven with earth and God dwells with us. It is crazy. It is crazy and amazing and beautiful. And you couldn't make this stuff up. A bunch of, a bunch of, a bunch of, <laughs> you know, ancient people cannot make this stuff up. This is, this is special revelation from God. Any other questions or comments? I hope that's making sense. If if Mount Zion, Mount Zion was in Eden, then it's just it's not a small part. It's not a small square kilometer Eden. It's a big square kilometer Eden. Yeah. But, but but remember remember Henry. It, it's so so the paradise of God. It it the eternal paradise of God transcends the original Eden. There was some mountain in, in um, because you actually see that with the land being formed. Explicitly, it's the land being formed. You, you have the Euphrates, the four rivers flowing out from a mountain. The mountain is not accented, but that mountain in, in the garden is, again, it's, it's like typological to, 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 to the eternal Mount Zion that, will tra it, that transcends it. Is that, is that making sense? I, I don't want to be confusing. Is, is that making sense? Yeah. Great question, Henry. Great clarification. So even the mountain transcends. Even the mountain transcends the first. The first, yeah. Excellent. And actually, you can trace this idea of mountain. It's so awesome. Um, or you can just go to Prayer Mountain and talk and the Babatno. It's there. <laughs> if if uh, Eden is a reception area of God's dwelling place, right? Yeah. yeah. Then was Satan also invited in by God to this reception area? So, so without going into all the different weeds, according to Ezekiel 28, he was present in the garden. Yeah. Yeah. And God allowed him. God did not, God did not, he could have just destroyed satan just like that he, but but he allowed him to bring about his greater purpose satan is completely liable he is guilty for his own sin adam and eve are guilty of their own sin yet god allowed in his sovereignty he allowed them to engage in that for his greater purpose but it did not uh compromise god's purity or holiness. absolutely not yeah yeah he allowed it but he was not part of it he permitted it. So God permits things to occur um, to fulfill his, but, but he is, he is no part in it. Yeah. In that sense. Good. Okay. Yeah. Let, let's right, take it. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, uh, just a quick one. Uh, this is just a quick analogy. Like what you said, uh, Cyrus here. Um, yeah, Cyrus. The paradise of God. Uh, and then uh, just an analogy is it like when we worship god here on earth and then we transcend to a place where like in the throne of god is, is it the same or different so i would not want to say i would not want to say that we transcend or, or we go to the throne of god we do experience god's presence here because of mm. the indwelling spirit and so we worship him here and he sees that worship and so even in this room, I can experience the presence of God through his spirit. I can worship him. Um, but uh, that's, that would be, uh, <laughs> that's, that's the next step in redemptive history, moving towards that, the climax of when God condescends fully and we are transformed with new resurrected bodies.
So it's still it's still on the way. And so Voss, this is for another class we will take, but we're caught between the already and not yet. We already have our spiritual birth, but not yet our physical uh, transformed bodies. So, right. so we're caught between um, that eternal blessed state. Although in the mind of God, with Christ being raised to the heavenly places, seated in the heavenly places, so we are seated with God. <laughs> so, yes. so in God's mind, we are already there, but yet we're yeah. still waiting. So anyway, so let's on that, let's, let's, maybe we'll do a Pauline theology in the fall. I don't know. Um, let's take a break. Um, I hope that we're seeing this picture here. I hope that we're seeing, um, you know, Jesus's critique of Voss is well taken. He is a hard read. He does not really explain. I hope that what you're seeing here, there is, I have not, I have really maintained Voss's um, teaching in, in, in both um, biblical theology and then some of the other writings that I've read. He, there's several other books by Voss. Um, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm not, what I'm not, what I'm, what I'm trying to, I'm, I'm kind of stuttering here. I'm not reinterpreting Voss is what I'm saying. I, I, I'm not reinterpreting Voss or saying, you know, trying to fill, I'm just trying to fill in the gaps that, that Voss had in his mind, but he didn't write on paper, you know, and maybe you'd say, Tim, you can't do that. But, but, but I'm only taking the passages that he had and I'm just expounding upon them a little bit further. Okay. He, he, he presupposed what we're just explicitly sharing. Okay, so let's take a 10 minute break and um, let's come back. Okay, we need to start. We, we really need to start. So let's go ahead and let's get, let's get back into it. And so um, I'm gonna share my PowerPoint again. And uh, so let's move on to the, uh, to the next principle, the principle of life. That is the river of life, the river of life. But this symbolism of paradise with its God-centered implication appears in still another form in the prophets and the Psalter. So not only in the tree of life, it's connected with the stream so significantly mentioned in Genesis 2 as belonging to the garden of God. Here also in part with eschatological reference. So what he's saying is not only is the tree of life, but also the streams. So let's go back and look at the significance of the streams, maybe someone will say, oh, it's not so significant. Maybe it is. We're going to go back and look at that. The prophets predict, the prophets predict that in the future age, waters will flow from the near dwelling place of Jehovah, his mountain, even as the tree stood in the midst of the garden, still in the apocalypse. So that's the revelation. We read that the streams of water of life proceed from the throne of God, the new Jerusalem. The trees of life are, are on either side. It will be observed that there are two symbolisms of the tree of life and the waters of life. They're interwoven. Okay. So when it comes to the symbolism, which we just saw in Revelation, the throne of God is there and the water is flowing out of the throne of God. Okay. So no one would discredit that reality. And, and so that's part of the, the life. And then also the trees of life are there as well, okay? So um, let's look at the scripture references we're going to go to, okay? So Ezekiel 47, we're going to go to Ezekiel 47. We're going to go to Zechariah 14, Psalm 46, John 4, and Revelation 21, 6, which we already referenced, okay? So let me go ahead and bring, bring these up. I'm going to first bring up Genesis so that everyone sees this. Okay. Okay. So let's look here really quick. So coming back up here, I always wondered, I always, I, I, I read Genesis so many times and I always wondered, this is just me personally. I always wondered why they, God spent so much time describing this it never really fit to me it never really fit i didn't understand okay when i read voss it was like light bulbs going off so let me just let's highlight some things a river flowed out of eden to water the garden 
So you have here a river that's flowing out of Eden, okay? So, so Eden, Eden is the garden of God. So from God's garden, there's a river that's flowing, that's, that's watering the garden. So this is for sure giving, everyone sees this. This is in the context. The significance, the significance here is that this is, this is giving life. The garden cannot be sustained without water. Physically, that's the reality, okay? Um, th but this river is just not for the garden. It divides and becomes four great rivers. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So it's like, what is it? What is going on here? Why is, why is God describing this? Why is God having Moses describe this? So it becomes four rivers. The name of the first, you have, you have the Paishan, you have the land of um, uh, the Gihon, you have the, the Tigris, and you have the Euphrates. But what you see here is that, let's just say the garden of God here, you have, you have this river that's watering the garden and then it's splitting into four. And it's, it's, it's pretty much supporting the entire known world at the time. So it's the big significance here is that no one questions this. This is just a standard symbolic, and, and it's not only reality, but it's, it be, becomes symbolic, right? Water sustains life. Is everyone tracking there with me? Water sustains life. And so this is a principle that's going to be picked up that transcends physical life and now deals with spiritual, eternal life. Everyone tracking there with me? Maybe you don't agree, but at least you can see. Okay, at least you can see this exegetically, if we do the exegetical work unquestioned, God was sustaining all of life, both inside the garden and outside the garden with this river. In this way, it's very similar to the tree of life. Right? Now, this could be literal or this could be figurative. This is a vision, okay? So Ezekiel is full of visions. So he's having this vision. So some people will say this is literal. Tell me if this sounds literal or if we understand the framework and recognize that there's this principle of water giving life that transcends physical life to eternal eschatological life. Tell me how this sounds, okay? What, we, what, we're, what, we're, what, we're, what we're gonna do is we're going, we're looking at We're looking at in, in time, you have the, the first, and then you're going to have a series of, so you have the prophets, you have the law, you have, this is, this is Eden, then you have Jesus' teaching, Then you probably have the epistles, and then you have the, the revelation, okay? So we're looking here, and we're looking both considering back, and we're looking here. This is what it means to look canonically, and for our purposes, biblical theologically, okay? So we're, we're reading this in its canonical context, in its biblical theological context, and also in its exegetical context. So this is a vision. So a vision could be literal or could be figurative, okay? Simply having a vision does not guarantee literal. Okay, so, so let's, let's read here. 
Then he brought me to the back door of the temple, and behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple. So we have here, I'm just going to use blue for water. So you have water coming out of the temple, okay? And it's, and it's flowing towards the east. The water is flowing down from below the south end of the threshold um, from the altar. So this is kind of a grotesque, crazy imagery. It's, the water is just going everywhere. It's like there's like a faucet, but back then there's no faucet, right? You don't have running water. You don't have pipes. There's a pipe broke. It's like going out. It's going out for the temple everywhere, okay? Then he brought me around to the north gate and led me around to the outside of the outer gate. And, and behold, the water was trickling out the south side. Going eastward with the measuring line in his hand, the man measured a thousand cubits. That's a large amount of, of measuring. Then led me through the water, and it was ankle deep. He again measured a thousand, led me through the water, and it was knee deep. He, he me again measured and led me through the water, and it was waist deep. Again, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass through. <laughs> so however big this river is, he cannot cross it. <laughs> so it's ginormous, okay? It was deep enough to swim in a, in a river that could not be passed through. So there's references twice here. It's this huge river that's coming out of the temple. The water is just appearing miraculously. <laughs> What's going on? What's going on? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. As I went back, I saw the bank of the river were many trees. On one side, he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down to Araba and enters the sea. When the water flows into the sea, the fresh, the, 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 the sea becomes fresh. So it's going into the sea where there's probably a salt water. Maybe it's the Dead Sea, but it's becoming fresh, okay? So I don't want to go into all these different, we, we don't have time to exegetically look at this right now, okay? So, but looking at this imagery here, the big picture, the big picture, it seems that that water it, it's moving on to this eternal eschatological sense. That's all I want to all I want to highlight here. Okay, is everyone tracking with me? Now a dispensational uh, literal view would say, no, this is going to happen one day. Okay, but but I think that it's meant to be taken figurative because it's a vision, and I think we should take it figuratively. Okay, water is transcending, it's it, the principle of life is now being brought into this eschatological internal sense, and notice here. Beal, Beal will pick up on this. Temple is the dwelling of God. So you have in Genesis, from the garden of God, you have water going out to water. Here you have the temple, which is the dwelling of God, that's sending out water. Everyone tracking with me? Let's now go to... Let's now go to, to Jesus' teaching. John 4, 7. A woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me to drink. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask me for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that was saying to you, give me to drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water from and the well is deep. So she is thinking physical water. Right? And no doubt in Eden, it's physical water, right? <laughs> physical water. Where did you get that living water? Are you greater than Jacob, our father? He gave us a well and he drank of it himself as his sons did in his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. I will give him this water 
it will become a spring of water welling up into eternal life. <laughs> I'm getting goosebumps. <laughs> Look at that. It kind of sounds like Ezekiel 47, right? It's this water coming out of nowhere. It's this spring that's just producing, right? You need water to live. And here now it's transcending that. It's, it's uh, water welling up to eternal life. Sir, give me this water. And then Jesus goes on to deal with her sin issue, okay? But what I want us to see here is that this water, this is already transcending. It's moving beyond physical to spiritual, uh, big, big word, eschatological. Now, Maybe you're going to disagree with me. Maybe you're going to say, Tim, this is allegorical. I disagree. But where is the, where is the temple? And if there is a temple here, defend it exegetically within the book of John. Where is the temple? And if so, exegetically, how can you defend it? Someone. Uh, the one who speaks is the temple. <laughs> and defend it exegetically, Sonny. Where do you see that exegetically? Well, he said that uh, the one who uh, he's the one who gave he's the one who gave the water, you know, uh, water flows from him. Yeah. So, so let's 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 come back here. So, uh, Jesus, Sonny has said that exegetically, the temple is Jesus. Um. Um. And, and the proof is in the giving of water, giving of eternal water. This is life. But I still need something stronger than that. You know, Sonny, I, my response would be you're, you're borderline allegorical. You know, my, my you know, a, a strong, someone who, who, you know, I think you're more allegorical. I need proof in John's gospel that he refers to himself or something about himself as being God's temple. Someone give me yeah. that proof. One, one fourteen. Yeah. Okay. One fourteen. Read it. Come on, do it. Read it. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Yeah. So the dwelling, the dwelling here, the, the, the Greek is literally uh, tabernacle tabernacled among us. Literally, tabernacled among us. So that's that's one proof. Give me another proof. I, I'm still I'm weak in my faith. I don't believe it, Sonny. Give me another reference to where Jesus okay. refers to uh, set himself. Uh, Go ahead. When Jesus said, "Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again." What's the passage? Red, John two nineteen. Uh, John two nineteen. So this is this is strike one, this is strike two, and this is strike three. <laughs> Everyone see that? This is very powerful. This is very powerful. And then the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the pudding when we go to, to Revelation. 21. Now look at this. Watch this. This is this is another proof for the deity of Christ. Watch. He who was seated, seated on the throne. So this is this is uh God the Father. He who was seated on the throne said, I'm making all things known. Write this down. These words are trustworthy. He said to me, It is done. Let me just make sure it's God the Father. Hold on, let me just make sure. I want to make sure it's not Jesus. Hold on. Okay, it's not clear. It could be it could be Jesus. So I don't want to I don't want to I have to think about that. Um but regardless regardless of this, the emphasis here 
if it's Jesus, it's actually a stronger proof for the deity of, of, of Christ because of the reference to Alpha and Omega beginning and end. So, so uh, whether it's the Father or Jesus, this is very strong. In, in verse 17. What does it say? The one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. Yeah, I think it's the father. I, I have to think about that. But it's it, it's like they're all confused because it's the Trinity. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it, it, it's it's a it's an interwoving of of the of the two roles and everything because they're coming together. That's the father, Diba. Someone correct me. It's the father, correct? Yeah, it's verse seven. It says yeah, verse it's, seven. It's, it's, it's the I will father. be his gun. Yeah, it's and he the will father. Be. Yeah. I will give him the spring of the water of life without payment. But yet Jesus is the one also giving it <laughs> to, the, to the woman. You see what I'm saying? So they're both. It's just the Trinitarian God is dwelling with us. The Trinitarian God is dwelling with us. So we're we're behind. We're behind. It's it's nine o'clock. Um Let's finish this because we still have a lot left. I don't want to rush this. We're still in the midst. I, I'm not, I don't want to rush. So if we are behind, it's okay. Um, let's pick this up next week. You will have new reading next week. We'll finish this within the first hour and then we'll continue with new content. So um, uh, let's just have a brief reflection. Um, what I want to do is I'm going to close everyone out. Let's go back to the breakout rooms. Let's discuss. We started 10 minutes late, so I want you to discuss for 10 minutes. Uh, I'll, I'm going to split you back out into the breakout rooms, and I want you to discuss what you've learned. Maybe you can give each other some pushback. Maybe you can give some encouragement, and then I want you to close in prayer. Someone, um, the leader, can, you can close in prayer, and we'll be dismissed. And what I want us to be thinking about here is, again, is, is, uh, even if you don't agree with everything that's being said, I hope that you really understand the importance of looking at revelation from the framework and look at these fundamental principles that will be unpacked, that God will continue to reveal to us until it comes to the full blossom in the end of revelation. And this has, uh, I hope that you'll never read Genesis 1, 2, and 3 the same again. I hope that you'll never read it again the, the same, that you'll see these significances. And I want us to be thinking about this. Every time you drink a water, every time you drink a cup of water and it sustains you, I want you to think about the, the water that's going to come out of the throne of God that we will be drinking, that cool, crystal clear water that we're going, to, we're going to go down in front of the throne of God and we're going to partake of it. Uh, God is giving us eternal life. And so he gives us these tokens that when our faith is low, when our strength is weak, when you drink that glass of water and you're stressed, be like, man, God is giving me a greater, I have greater water that's that's flowing up now. It's, 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 it's a spring of water flowing up now in me already, but not yet. <laughs> so I want, us to, I want us to think about the practical ramifications. Look at these physical, look at these physical, um, I want us to be thinking about these physical images that, that, that teach us these greater spiritual truths that are, are, that are, that are real, that are now. And and when you read the prophets, when you look at water and the tree of life in the Proverbs, you also need to be making these connections when you preach. This has huge practical implications in our preaching, in our teaching. Um, this is part of the exegetical process. This is not, uh, I believe this with all my heart, maybe you disagree, this is not allegorical interpretation. This is, this is typology, and if we accept the truth, that baptism is a type, Peter says it. If we accept the truth that manna was a type, Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 10. 
if we believe that the Lamb of God is a type of uh, I'm sorry, the, the lamb, the Passover lamb is a type of the lamb of God who's taken away the sins of the world. Um, if we believe that the Levitical priesthood is a type of the eternal priesthood uh, in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, if we believe those are types, wh why can't we just include these? Let's consider that. It's not running around rough, uh, roughshod, willy-nilly, interpreting whatever. It's in context. It's in canonical context. We're looking at the whole. It's in the framework. Um, the framework guides us and constrains us. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead. Let's let's break into your groups. I hope that you are blessed. I hope that you have some new insight. It's deep. I, you know, my prayer. I pray for you, students. My prayer is that it's deep, but that you will not drown. You will swim. <laughs> you will swim. You will swim, and you will enjoy your swim. In the sun. So let's. With that, I'm going to dismiss. Um, may 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 uh, may God be with you all. And I will dismiss you. Please go in peace.